have used one of those home DNA kits to build your family tree online, but in recent years, these genetic genealogy tests have been used to crack cold cases and identify victims and even catch killers. Tonight, Fox 9 investigator Nathan O'Neill digs into this emerging technology and how it's being leveraged right here in Minnesota. Nathan, what'd you find? Yeah, well, it's a relatively new type of technology that's already giving new life to cold cases, but it's also posing some pretty big questions about how and when it should be used. Today, the sheriff announced they have positively identified human remains found in 1982. The White Bear Lake family whose loved one disappeared nearly 40 years ago. And the case went cold, cold. A swab of the cheek can help you build your family tree but it can also unlock decades old secrets. It would have been very difficult to solve any of the cases any other way. A new method for solving crimes and serving justice. Does it shock you to know your DNA is there? A genetic tool reportedly used in a nationwide manhunt after the murder of four Idaho college students. We do believe justice will be found through the criminal process. Raising new questions about the technology. That's really where this debate is. And how it's used in Minnesota. Can we ensure that there aren't ethical concerns or considerations and it's being done responsibly? On the banks of the frozen Mississippi River is where some mysteries have turned ice cold. In 1976, a woman known only then as Lily Dale Jane Doe was pulled from the river near St. Paul. She had likely been dead for weeks. The case went cold after 45 years with no answers and no idea who she was or where she came from. That is until genetic genealogist Tracy Boyle got involved from more than a thousand miles away. So we did know that her body was found floating in the Mississippi River when she was very young. I think she was like 22 at the time of her death. Boyle is one of nearly 100 volunteers nationwide with a nonprofit DNA Doe project, which uses public DNA databases to identify family matches through a method known as genetic genealogy to help identify unidentified remains. It's not much different than anybody doing their genealogy. It's, it's reverse engineering a family tree. Using that method, she helped identify Lily Dale Jane Doe. Her real name was in fact Roberta Seifert, born in 1954 in Tucson, Arizona. But many questions remain with the cause of her death still a mystery. Genetic genealogy may seem complicated, but the idea is straightforward. Say you want to identify your victim, or perhaps even a suspect, and all you have is the DNA. You can upload that genetic information to certain public DNA databanks, like GenMatch. From there, you can search for family matches, working your way from extended family to closer ones like parents in hopes of identifying your target. In Minnesota, law enforcement agencies are increasingly turning to genetic genealogy to revisit unsolved cases. Typically, it's been utilized so far just in cases that we would consider quote-unquote cold cases, cases where we have a full DNA profile. Drew Evans is superintendent of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. He tells the Fox 9 investigators the agency relies on third-party groups since the type of DNA testing done at the state lab is not the same type used for genetic genealogy. It really is used in those cases where we are trying to solve the unsolvable, uh, the cases that we have exhausted other methodologies, other techniques, and it's providing us a lead to determine whether or not we can uh, identify the perpetrator through this technology. In Minnesota, genetic genealogy has been tried in at least 23 cases. So far, it's solved at least five unidentified persons cases and four homicide cases. For example, take the 1993 murder of Jeannie Childs, where the 35-year-old was stabbed to death inside her apartment. The trail went cold until 25 years later when DNA collected at the crime scene was run through new public genealogy databases, which pointed to Jerry Westrom. The reason that we're talking is she was found deceased in her, in her apartment, okay? and we, we think that you were inside that apartment. By the time Westrom was brought in for questioning, investigators had already tailed him at a hockey game in Wisconsin, where he trashed this used napkin. Does it shock you to know your DNA is there? Yes. It was a key piece of DNA evidence that ultimately led to Westrom's conviction for the murder of Jeannie Childs.
Today, perhaps one of the most consequential cases turns our attention to Moscow, Idaho. It's here where genetic genealogy may have been key to solving an active case, the murder of four university students. It's been widely reported that authorities used public DNA databases to zero in on their prime suspect. Well, I think what's interesting about that particular case is that genetic genealogy is not mentioned anywhere in the court records or affidavits at this point. Professor Jamie Spaulding of Hamlin University heads the forensic science department there. He's watching how genetic genealogy will play out in the courtroom. You know, moving forward, does that change how it's practiced or does that set some standards for this? Because at the moment, it's done in a variety of different ways across the country. There are no standards of practice. In Minnesota, genetic genealogy has not been applied to any active cases. And right now, there are no laws that regulate it. But could that genetic technology be used right here in Minnesota in active cases in the near future? Well, the answer to that is just truly unclear. I think we should carefully think about where this could add value, especially in those horrific crimes that we see that create significant community concern or cases where we can bring answers to families ongoing. But Professor Spaulding tells us there are some ethical considerations. So you're actively investigating people that you know could not have committed this. I think that's an ethical uh, concern and debate that we're having in the community. I think another that a lot of media talks about is the right to privacy. Even so, the technology does have challenges, from its efficiency to its legal limitations. There's a strong track record both in Minnesota and across the country that the technology works. But it's a lead, and it's a lead in criminal investigations because it doesn't identify the individual that was the perpetrator of the crime in the same way that it does with traditional DNA that we use in our laboratories day in, day out. And now is the time to start thinking about how we can best utilize this technology. Now, if you are concerned about privacy, DNA testing companies like Ancestry and 23andMe do not make your information readily available for law enforcement. In both those cases, they require a court order. So if that's the case, Nathan, what kind of databases are law enforcement using then? Well, there are some public data banks like GEDmatch, which we mentioned, which do work with law enforcement. They actually require you to upload your own data from testing companies like Ancestry. But in any case, those data banks usually require you to opt in before allowing law enforcement to access your genetic information. Interesting stuff. Right right. On the of cut, a cutting edge of technology. It is fascinating and to see how it's being used more and more, too. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Nathan.